very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Rema. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to the UNEP. We do not take for granted the support that we continue to receive from UNEP and all your partners. Thank you very much. Uh, Our Excellency, may allow me to acknowledge the presence of Lord Robert Comworth, a former Supreme Court Judge of the United Kingdom. Thank you very much for joining us. At this juncture, Your Excellency, I will request the Honorable the Deputy Chief Justice, Vice President of the Supreme Court of Kenya, of the Republic of Kenya, to come forward and uh, make her remarks and take on the remaining part, the next part of the program. Honorable Philomena Mbete Mwilu. Um, thank you, Chief Registrar. Excellency, the President of the Republic of Kenya, who is also the commander of our defense forces, Dr. William Samoe Ruto, the Honorable the Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya, Mother Kome, Mr. Speaker, sir, uh, the Honorable Mr. Moses Wetangula, otherwise known as Masika. My lords, the Chief Justices of Africa, I am very delighted that uh, this is real. It has finally happened. I am happy that uh, I stand here to welcome all of you to Nairobi, Kenya, the green city in and under the sun, uh, Karibu Sana, Nairobi, Kenya, Hakuna Matata. I am delighted to join all of us today and to be the one to start making everybody comfortable in the judiciary of Kenya. It's not lost on any of us, particularly those of us of um, judicial minds, that this is an extremely important conference on strengthening the capacity of judiciaries across the region in addressing the intersecting and global environmental crisis that is the environmental degra degradation, biodiversity loss, and climate change. Judiciaries have an important role to play in strengthening the domestic, regional, and global legal framework. And so those of us from the judiciary are here to learn, to green our judicial minds so that our jurisprudence on the environment is sufficiently greened so as to tackle climate change and all the effects on the environment. Our approach must be collaborative and our solutions contextual yet integrated. Hence the reason why Africa is present in Nairobi, Kenya. Colleagues, I look forward to learning, to sharing ideas and best practices from across the region of Africa. It is the cross vitalization of ideas, innovations and approaches that will improve our legal frameworks and green jurisprudence on issues climate change, enhance access to justice in related matters and ultimately contribute to the global effect in addressing 
climate change. I'm happy it is happening during my time and I'm happy that it is happening in Nairobi, Kenya. Welcome. Um, and let us learn, let us take time to learn because after the third symposium in Nairobi, all of us in the judiciary in Africa will be expected to think green, to think climate change, to think how to stop the adverse effects of misbehaving on the environment. It is my privileged honor to invite Mr. Speaker, sir, the Speaker of the National Assembly of Kenya, to address us, and thereafter, please take the opportunity to invite my Chief Justice to speak to us, and thereafter, we proceed. Asante Nesana. Thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. Your Excellency, our President and Commander-in-Chief, my Lord Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya and other law lords present, our Attorney General, our Ministers present, ladies and gentlemen. Mine will be very brief. When you talk environment, sometimes you want to talk from your heart. Everywhere you go in our villages, our grandmothers, our elder citizens have a very common talk that it is not and has never been like this. They'll tell you when we settled here, this was a forest and you see no tree around. They'll tell you when we settled here, there was a spring down there and there's no spring today. They'll tell you it was very difficult to cross that river to go to the other part of our land and there's no river. That is the change of our environment. Permanent rivers are now seasonal. Forests have been destroyed to a level where there are now assholes. And above all, the diminishing rain pattern is a worry to all of us. So when the judiciary comes together, to think green, to think environment, it is very encouraging to many of us. I believe, Chief Justice, you invited me here to give you an assurance that any legislative proposals that comes to Parliament on many matters, but particularly on environment, will be given top priority. Your Excellency, we need a serious review of environmental related legislation because most of it predates our independence when we used to tap offenders on the wrist and tell them to go away. People armed with power saws mowing down forests with impunity get away with it. People who release pollutants into our fresh water sources like rivers get away with impunity. I'm sure, Excellency, a year ago you read the serialization in one of our dailies of the death of a river. Right from Nairobi, where is the source, to the end in the Indian Ocean, it's a sludge. And from that sludge, Wanainji grow crops that they bring back to us to eat. 
highly toxic material. So as the judiciary gets at the centerpiece of greening the world, the judiciary only enforces the law that we pass. And they also punish those that you take there to be punished. The Chief Justice will not stand on the street corner and hand for offenders. She sits and waits for them. So I urge the Executive, Your Excellency, to be firm in dealing with those who destroy environment, those who pollute our environment, those who pollute our rivers. And finally, you are all Africans. We are told in every symposium we go that the Congo Basin and the Amazon Basin are the lungs of the world. But every day you fly over the Congo or read about the Congo, you are told of how many millions of acres of Congo are disappearing. We urge you, the law lords, to ensure that you also exert a bit of influence on the executive. Don't sit there and wait for the laws to be brought to you to interpret and administer. Also make proposals to the executive that this law, the punishment is too lenient, the enforcement is difficult, make it easier so that we can be able to protect our environment. Your Excellency, I want to salute you for announcing that Kenya is going to plant 15 billion trees. This is a very positive step. But as we plant the trees, Your Excellency, we must have a clear roadmap on how to plant the trees, how to look after those trees, and how to protect those trees. In certain jurisdictions, you cannot cut down a tree in your own home without permission. But in our country, sometimes we take liberties and cut trees that are not even on our properties. Let me end here by saluting all of you, law lords, with our Chief Justice taking the lead for bringing this important meeting to Kenya. And I believe that at the end of the meeting, Kenya will be a lot richer in our protection and sustainment of our environment. Thank you, Chief Justice. I now invite you. Thank you very much, my brother, the speaker of the National Assembly, uh, Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Kenya, Dr. William Ruto, uh, for to recognize the speaker, the Honorable Chief Justices from the various jurisdictions present here this morning, the Deputy Chief Justice, Cabinet Secretary, and the Attorney General, all the judges from various jurisdictions present, Your Excellencies, judges, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Indeed, it is an honor and a great privilege for me to stand before you today and welcome you to Nairobi, the green city in the sun. But before I speak, I wish to recognize the former two Chief Justices, the Honorable Professor Wiri Motunga, our first Chief Justice, under the Kenya Constitution, and the Honorable Justice David Maraga. Many people have mentioned your name. If you could come here, both of you, my lords, and just say hello to these delegates. I am very, very honored to have you 
in this forum. I am standing on your great shoulders because you started the judiciary on our transformation. Please greet the audience. Oh. <laughs> Karibuni Kenya. <laughs> Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Kenya, the Chief Justices here present and uh, all the dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be with you here. When I was in Zimbabwe in 2019 and I requested that this meeting be held here, we thought we were going to hold it in 2020 but we all know what happened and it was not possible. I'm happy if just that uh, at last it is uh, come and uh, you've been able to host this meeting here. Mm -hmm. We are delighted to have all of you here. Mm -hmm. May God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my brothers. I stand on their broad shoulders because they set up the judiciary transformation framework that set us on the path of ensuring that we create a very strong, independent judiciary. When I became the Chief Justice, we agreed we continue on that trajectory, and the only uh, diversion I took is that I am a woman, I wear shoe number five, <laughs> and there are high heels, I warned myself not to walk in their shoes, but to stand on their shoulders, which is the framework that they established. Thank you very much, my brothers. As we gather here, we are not lamenting. We, as Africa, we are solidifying our voices to say that we will firmly protect our environment because it affects us and we have the responsibility to own it and care for it for the future generations. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, for speaking from your heart because I think we need to simplify this message of environmental protection. And I'm being a child rights defender what I'm telling people now is that we need to nurture our environment the same way we nurture our children. I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to each one of you for making time to come to Nairobi to attend this symposium. Your Excellency, this is indeed a sign of all our unwavering commitment and dedication to the cause of environmental justice. And your esteemed presence today is a testament to the importance and urgency of the issues we are here to discuss and also to resolve. We as African judiciaries, we have already agreed on a pathway to forge a corrective front in the fight against climate change. As we gather here in Nairobi, I am happy to share with you that the Kenyan judiciary is committed to serving as the hub for African judiciary's dialogue. We need to talk to each other as Africans. You have heard that we are bearing a bigger burden or the effect of the climate change. This is enough to bring us together. And for us in the Kenyan judiciary, we view hosting regional judiciary dialogues also as a means of fostering the development of African jurisprudence that is responsive to the unique concerns and aspirations of our continent. It is our vision to create a robust and dynamic platform 
for knowledge exchange, for our capacity building, and collaboration among African judiciaries, enabling us to better understand, interpret, and apply the law to promote the social development and transformation of our respective judiciaries. In this context, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we view this three-in-one symposium on climate change as part of regional judicial dialogue aimed at providing a platform for us African judges and judicial officers to exchange ideas, learn from each other, and acquire the requisite knowledge, skills, and tools needed to effectively address the challenges facing our continent. As we all know, our continent is particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Our people, our economies, and our natural resources are all at risk as we grapple with the devastating consequences of rising temperatures, erratic weather patterns, and loss of biodiversity. It is within this context that our courts must play a decisive role in driving the adaptation, mitigation, and resilience building efforts required to combat climate change and to secure a sustainable future for our people. Indeed, our courts are the guardians of the rule of law and protectors of the constitutional rights, including the fundamental right to a clean and healthy environment. As judges, we have unique responsibility of interpreting and applying the law in a manner that promotes environmental sustainability, social equity, and intergenerational justice. This requires us to be bold, to be innovative, and proactive in our approach to environmental litigation, ensuring that our decisions and judgments contribute to the realization of a greener, more resilient Africa. In Kenya, we have made significant strides in promoting a transformative environmental constitutionalism that is rooted in the provisions of our constitution and the jurisprudence of our national environmental tribunal and the Environment and Land Court and other superior courts. Our courts have played a critical role in advancing environmental justice in Kenya by interpreting and applying the constitution and other laws in a manner that promotes sustainable use and management of our land and natural resources. But moving forward from this symposium, we are saying we need to work with everybody else and also build their capacities and build their awareness about environmental protection. And as we look to the future, it is imperative that our judiciaries in Africa will continue to play a proactive role in the fight against climate change and building successes and lessons learned from our experiences thus far. We must be unyielding in our pursuit for justice, ensuring that our decisions and judgments contribute to the realization of a greener, more resilient and sustainable Africa. In this regard, I call my brother and sister chief justices and judges present here today. We all join hands in a united front against climate change. We leverage on our collective wisdom, expertise, and our power of convening others to develop a jurisprudence that is uniquely African and responsive to our shared concerns. Let us collaborate, let us learn from one another, and share our experiences as we work together to build a brighter, more sustainable future for our continent and our people. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, allow me to reiterate that as guardians of the rule of law and the protectors 
of the constitutional rights of our people, we have a unique responsibility to ensure that our decisions and judgments contribute to greener, resilient, and sustainable Africa. Let us seize this moment to reaffirm our commitment to the cause of environmental justice and to print our unwavering support to all the efforts that have been put together by our respective judiciaries in combating climate change. Together we can make a difference and together we can build a brighter, more sustainable future for our continent and our people. I wish you all a very, very fruitful and enriching symposium and I am confident that our deliberations in the next few days will yield meaningful insights and lasting partnerships that will serve to strengthen our collective resolve in the fight against climate change. Once again, Your Excellency, I extend a very, very warm welcome to our guests to Nairobi and pray that our shared efforts in pursuit of environmental justice will bear fruit for generations to come. And now, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, my own sad ladies, please join me as I welcome His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Kenya, to address this gathering and officially open the symposium. Welcome, sir, to come and visit. Please, let's take our seats. <clears throat> Madam Chief Justice and President of our Supreme Court, uh, Madam Deputy Chief Justice, uh, Chief Justice Emeritus, the Honorable Willie Mutunga and the Honorable David Maraga, Chief Justices from various parts of our continent, um, judges of the Supreme Court, distinguished judicial officers from different parts of our continent, ladies and gentlemen, and our visitors, good morning and welcome. Welcome to Nairobi and welcome to Kenya. I join Madam Chief Justice for uh, the convener of this uh, symposium in welcoming you to both Nairobi and, and Kenya. Let me volunteer some information about Nairobi and about Kenya. About Nairobi, um, this is the city that has a national park within 10 minutes from your hotel. So you may find some lion or cheetah <laughs> because sometimes they escape from the national park. <laughs> Please be careful because they are not domesticated. Uh, welcome to Kenya, and again on this one, I speak uh, with the authority of a scientist, being a scientist myself, that science has proved that Kenya is the cradle of mankind. You may find yourself having this feeling that you are more at home here <laughs> than from where you come from. Please understand that this is where we all started. And we can tell you, welcome home. <laughs> and it is inspiring to be here to witness Africa's judicial leadership as you mobilize your judicial authority, intellectual power, and moral commitment to intervene in our generation's defining struggle. I am highly encouraged to note the depth of thought 
in your appreciation of the existential magnitude of climate change and of the imperative for urgent action by all stakeholders anchored on common institutional coordination. Although climate change is a universal existential threat, there is good reason for Africa's institutions and leadership to drive the agenda of mitigating its effects and eliminating the human activity that is driving it. The first reason is the fact that Africa is by far the least polluting continent, yet it is by far the most adversely affected by climate change. The entirety of industrial and economic activity from all of the continent's economies contributes less than 5% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. These emissions are the cause of a steady and dangerous rise in global temperatures, which have resulted in the extinction of plants and animal species, rise in sea levels, disruptions in climate patterns, drought, and desertification. The brunt of these adverse effects and impacts has been borne by vulnerable African populations residing in less developed parts of the world. Droughts are more frequent and more severe. Our region has undergone a five season long drought which has decimated domestic and wild animal populations, wiped out food crops, disrupting and threatening the lives of millions of people. Water stress caused by climate change has been devastating both directly and as a driver of conflict over water and pastures. Poverty has been exacerbated by loss of livestock, which forms the mainstay of pastoralist economy, economic livelihoods, and massive crop failure, which weakened the foundations of farming economies. In addition to drought, African populations are experiencing floods, heat waves, and outbreak of climate change related diseases. African livelihood, security and development is in danger and will remain at stake unless we collectively wage aggressive combat to reverse the situation through policies and other institutional action to implement mitigation, enhance adaptation, and build resilience. The looming climate disaster is particularly tragic for Africa, which is entering a new promising era of peace and prosperity as the continent of the future. Many vital indicators have found that indeed Africa is rising, powered by its youthful population, energy, resources, and hope. It is important for Africa to undertake concerted action to win the war on climate change because it is disproportionately affected by its ad adverse impacts and also because necessary global responses to climate change are going to institute structural change. The institutional configurations and economic resets emanating from this structural change will install Africa, not only as a continent of the future, but as the world's green economic superpower. Africa is abundantly endowed with all the resources required to power green industrialization. Our clean and green power potential is incomparable. Just to give you indications, 92% of our grid in Kenya is clean and green. It is the case in many other African countries and the potential to make it the case in many African nations is real and is possible. Our clean and green power potential, as I said, is immense. Hydro, geothermal, wind, 
and solar power potential is super abundant. The mineral resources needed for green energy technology also exists plentifully in our continent. We are the world's youngest continent with a mean age of 25 and growing younger every year. Our people constitute a three billion strong market and a pool of skilled, motivated and capable workforce. Future global sustainability will depend on a robust engagement with Africa in many fundamental ways. The world knows this and African institutions and stakeholders must be ready for this engagement. And that is why this symposium is very important. I am very proud of the firm commitment demonstrated by the African Union in this matter. At COP27, which was held last November in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, Africa's voice was clear. The development path taken by the world's economic and industrial powers is unsustainable and prejudicial to Africa and the global south. Climate change has brought home that fact in sobering detail. Africa is emphatic that although prosperity is an urgent goal to liberate our people from the indignity of poverty and inequality, the path of pollution is not an option. The African Union prefers a more ecologically responsible industrialization, one that promotes multi-sectoral climate resilience in agriculture and food systems, water resources, energy, transport and infrastructure, among others. We also insist quite firmly that international development financing must be more appropriate for the needs of our existential moment in terms of how much resources is accessible, affordable, and adequate. In February, I was encouraged to witness the impressive level of, of activity accomplished by African group of negotiators, especially at COP27, as well as the various African climate change initiatives. The Committee of African Heads of State and Governments on Climate Change, which I chair, also coordinates various African climate change commissions that are doing extremely important work in many regions of our continent to implement the Africa climate change and green recovery agenda. I'm also honored to lead Kenya's participation in these regional, continental, and climate actions. It is a privilege to join our African brothers and sisters in this good fight and make our contribution to the defining struggle of our generation. Africa is alive to the imperative of this moment in a way that is simply inspiring. I will share with you Kenya's experience of this journey so far. From the very inception, our aspirations for economic development and shared prosperity has been inextricably tied to a firm commitment to environmental sustainability. In my earlier statement, I did paint the picture of where we are as a continent. I mean, the power of industrialization that has been premised on fossil fuels, despite its adverse its effects, is what has driven industrialization in the world so far. The world today is at a crossroads. The crossroads being, do we continue the fossil fuel powered industrialization, which is destroying our globe with disastrous effects? Or do we go green? I think that decision is no longer a decision that we are waiting to make. 
It is an existential threat that faces us as humanity and the option is already made for us that we can only go green. Why Africa is in a pivotal position as we go green is because number one, Africa has the highest reserves and potential for green energy, whether it is geothermal, wind, solar, hydro. No other part of the world has the resources we have. Number two, we have the resources in our continent, the mineral resources, the natural resources, for green energy technology. Number three, we have the greatest potential for green sustainable agriculture and food production because two-thirds of the world's uncultivated arable land is in Africa. And number four, we have the youngest population, energetic, innovative, creative. And in any case, a quarter of the world's population will live in the African continent by 2050. So if you are looking for the people to work for this globe, for humanity, whether you like it or not, they will be in the African continent. Forget about the small migration that is happening now from Africa. Shortly, I promise you, the migration will be in the opposite direction. Very shortly. The only thing that stands between us and the huge potential we have in this continent. And I want to encourage you as chief justices of our continent, the only thing that stands between us and this huge potential is a financial system that was designed to serve at different time. And that is why we are insisting that we must rethink the international financial system to align it with the reality and the imperative of this moment. It is not sustainable anymore for us the, have the IMF and the World Bank and the International Financial Institution in its current configuration. And we are not saying we want an international financial system that is favorable to Africa. No. We want an international financial system that is fair to everybody. <laughs> Having a fair international financial system is not asking for too much. I think it's just asking for what is fair. We want to access development resources at the same rate as everybody else is. It is a fallacy for anybody to imagine that it is possible to grow any part of the world to the, ex uh, to the exclusion of any other part of the world. Because whether we like it or not, we share this globe. And if today anybody imagines that climate change is affecting the global south more than the global north, it won't be, it won't be for long. Shortly, we will all either float or sink. So the sooner we have a fair international financial system that makes it possible for us as humanity to exploit all the resources available to us in a sustainable manner, the better for all of us as humanity. The sooner we get ourselves there, the better. As a continent, 
we want to have a conversation that is balanced. Even as we demand for a fair international financial system, Africa will be coming to the table with our assets. We will not be coming to the table in any other manner. We will come to the table with our assets. We have tremendous renewable energy resources that can power green industrialization, green sustainable agriculture. We will be coming to the table with millions of enthusiastic, hardworking, innovative, creative young people. We will be coming to the table with our natural and mineral resources that can be used for green technology to power the world's future. We will be coming to the table with a huge 3 billion African market. So we will be coming with assets. And I think, good people, we must make our case unapologetically so that we can occupy our place on the table. Because I am told, if you are not on the table, you possibly could be in the menu. <laughs> the commitment by the people of Kenya goes further and deeper. When we enacted a new constitution in 2010, we placed the environment at the, as the, at the foundation of our normative and institutional architecture. The fourth paragraph of our constitution's preamble states that our respect for the environment and determination to sustain it was one of the motiv motivating premises in enacting our constitution. Article 42 entrenches a clean and healthy environment as a fund fundamental human right, while Article 67 and 70 set out the framework for the enforcement of environmental rights and obligations. Once we enter the domain of rights and obligations, the respective mandates of the three arms of government automatically follow. Article 21, the state is required as a fund fundamental duty to take legislative policy and other measures required to actualize these rights. Because of the centrality of land in economic and social and cultural and environmental discourse, the Constitution institutes a robust framework for land and environmental governance with a dedicated constitutional commission and the consequential establishment of the Land and Environment Division of the High Court. The court adjudicates matters related to land, including natural resources and environmental sustainability. <clears throat> As a matter of national policy, Kenya has been involved in environmental diplomacy since the early years of our republic. At the famous Stockholm Conference in 1972, my predecessor and all of us, we impressed on the United Nations for the need to have a dedicated multilateral environmental agency and lobbied to host it in Africa. As a result, the headquarters of the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, is based here in Nairobi. It means it remains the only UN global headquarters in the global south. And for your information, the largest. In 1992, Kenya called the world's attention to the emerging threat of depletion of the ozone layer by toxic emissions and to the buildup of greenhouse gas emissions which posed dangerous consequences on life on Earth. Today, we remain strongly committed to our national tradition of championing ecological responsibility throughout the world, but starting here at home. 
In 2016, Parliament enacted the Climate Change Act, providing us the institutional framework to anchor the national response to climate change. It also legislated the Environmental Management and Coordination Act, which sets out the principles, standards, and procedures for the sustainable use, conservation, and management of the environment and all our natural resources. In December last year, I launched a national green national tree planting drive. The Forest and Rangeland Restoration Initiative aims to grow 15 billion trees by the year 2030, and this will increase the national tree cover from the current 12.3 percent to 30 percent, which will be three times the constitutionally mandated minimum of 10 percent. It will further contribute to our African Landscape Restoration Initiative target, as well as other initiatives to restore degraded lands, forests, and water towers. The Government of Kenya is also taking measures to ensure that every ministry, department, and agency aligns its policies, strategies, programs, and projects with our green agenda. Strengthening the role of judiciaries in addressing climate change in Africa, which is the theme of this symposium, is highly appropriate, and it is also of fundamental significance to our collective readiness to take up global leadership in post-transition economic and industrial order, and thus usher the world into a future of green, clean, and inclusive uh, prosperity. I congratulate you for holding the third regional symposium on green judiciaries in Africa. I also recognize that you are also holding the third Chief Justice Forum on Environmental Law, as well as the third General Conference of the Africa Judicial Education Network on Environmental Law. Thank you for doing it now and hosting them here in Kenya. We are deeply honored to be your hosts, and I hope that we have lived up to your reputation for legendary, for, to our reputation of legendary hospitality, magical attraction, and delightful experiences. Critically, this event demonstrates beyond any doubt that our judiciaries have come of age. We cannot take this development for granted because our judiciaries will determine whether Africa's institutions exist and are ready to handle the immense mandate that a green future entails for all of us and for the world. Claims, disputes, standards, rights, and responsibilities related to the use of land and natural resources, the institutional framework for financing climate change, carbon trading and exchanges, and transition management frameworks are only some of the areas in which our judiciaries are going to be involved. They must, therefore, pronounce themselves in a manner consistent with the values and aspirations of a continent on the rise. Greening our judiciaries will be inevitably multisectoral and interdisciplinary. Beyond local and international human rights, constitutional environment, trade, and economic law, our judiciaries must be exposed to diverse fields such as ecology, economics, agriculture, food systems, trade and finance, carbon markets, energy, and infrastructure, just to mention a few. To fully play your part in arbitrating and auditing Africa's aspirations to lead a new industrial revolution, our judiciaries will have to collaborate across the length and breadth of our continent, engage with diverse knowledge domains, and interact with numerous sectors. They should also formulate a unified understanding of sustainability as the guarantor of prosperity, peace and security, ecological integrity, and human well-being. 
your decisions will matter a great deal. They will shape climate governance and enhance environmental justice by promoting accountability for environmental harm and facilitating collective action by all stakeholders. A few days ago, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution that the International Court of Justice renders an opinion obligating the world's biggest emitters to take responsibility for their actions. I equally challenge our judiciary to be creative and imaginative and develop jurisprudence that will enhance climate action based on the polluter pays principle. You must not underestimate your capacity because it leads to positive change. I agree with our Chief Justice statement that our judiciary should not be left behind in this fight for our sustainable future. I therefore urge you to intensify your conscious place in this historic moment and take a decision to have your voices heard for the sake of our generations and the generations yet to be born. You are here to contribute a chapter to the world's history. I encourage you to proceed and write a fresh chapter of African resilience, sustainability, and global leadership in a new green industrial age. Together with the rest of Africa, I look forward to receiving a positive report about your robust engagements and fruitful deliberations. It is now my pleasure to declare the third regional symposium on green judiciaries in Africa formally opened. Thank you very much. God bless you. And God bless our great continent. Asante San. Can we just have one more warm applause for our president, Your Excellency? Thank you for those wonderful words. We only have two things we'd like to do in the, this program as we wind up. One is to finish off with the national anthem. Then we have some pictures we'd like taken. And your lords and lady justices, kindly, I request that I guide you on the photos. The third thing will be lunch. Of course, after such a wonderful speech, uh, it would be nice to have something in our stomach. So we'll start with the national anthem. Then I'll guide you on how we're going to do the photographs. We'll take them out there. We've arranged some but kindly allow me to guide you on how we'll exit so that we'll do that decently and in order. But we start off with winding up with the national anthem. And with that, kindly, we'll have the uh, Honorable Justice Martha Kome escort His Excellency, the President, followed by Lady Justice Philomena, uh, Philomena Mwilu, Honorable Justin Muturi, the Attorney General, Cabinet Secretaries present, Principal Secretaries, Honorable Lady Justice Nambita Dambuza, Miss Elizabeth Bremer, Honorable Justice Dr. Smoking Wanjala, Dep the Deputy Governor, and the Chief Registrar of the Judiciary. So kindly, the rest of us, if we can allow them to exit, we'll just have a photo taken. I'll guide you on who else will follow after that. So thank you very much as we now allow him to retreat. So that list again, His Excellency the President, Honorable Justice Martha Kome, Lady Justice Philomena Mwilu, Honorable Moses Watangula, Honorable Justin Muturi, Cabinet Secretaries and Principal Secretaries present, Honorable Lady Justice 
Professor Nambitha Dambuza, Ms. Elizabeth Mrema, Honorable Justice Dr. Smoking Wanjala, the Deputy Governor, and the Chief Registrar of the Judiciary. The rest I re request that we remain seated. I'll guide you on how we shall exit after this. It won't take long, so kindly, uh, your patience is appreciated. Let's also have the CJ Emeritus to also join this photograph, please. And that is uh, Honorable Justice Maraga um, to kindly join on this photo. The Kenya Police Band, you're welcome to just give us some soft music as we wait for that photo to be taken, then I'll guide on the rest. So photo number two, if I can kindly request that we have all Chief Justices and heads of delegation to proceed to the foyer there. You'll just be in waiting, uh, then the photo will be taken. So all uh, Chief Justices and heads of delegation, kindly proceed. All Chief Justices and heads of delegation. Judges of Environment and Land Court can proceed. All judges and environment uh, and land court can proceed. <laughs> 